Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're now going to begin our program. And uh, it's my honor to welcome you to our annual graduate colloquium. I'm Stephen Ritchie, director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Irvine. We're delighted that so many of you could be here in person and those who are online who I can't see, but very happy that you're with us virtually as well. Uh, just by way of a little bit of background, uh, my colleague, Sarah Katz, and I started this. Can I mention this is my favorite class that I've ever had? Uh, Sarah gets applause, but not me. <laughs> Uh, Sarah and I started this colloquium a number of years ago. Uh, I lost count of how seven. many, but yeah, I heard it was seven, which is quite amazing. I think it was Sarah's suggestion that we did that. And uh, the idea was basically because we had planning and engineering students who were studying transportation from different perspectives, and we wanted to bring uh, those students together to hopefully develop a shared and better understanding of important transportation problems and issues, and that's still our goal today, but we're really pleased that this colloquium has expanded over the years, <clears throat> survived the pandemic, and with the advent of online technology, Zoom and, and others, uh, has attracted a much broader participation uh, from interested students and stakeholders across California and even beyond. So as you know, today our focus is uh, equity and the future of mobility, an issue that's really at the forefront of um, much transportation policy practice and research, certainly in California these days, uh, drives much of what we do in terms of our research and also our teaching, but also the nation. So we have an absolutely amazing panel with us today, and um, Sarah will introduce them in a moment, but I would like to thank each of our panel members for the time they've taken out of their schedules to share their knowledge and insights with us today. I just wanted to mention that our colleague, uh, Joe Demento, distinguished professor of law, was to join our panel originally, but had to withdraw uh, just the other day, actually, uh, for medical reasons, so we send Joe our best wishes. Okay, so it's with much excitement and anticipation that I'd like to now introduce my colleague, Sarah Katz, who's going to moderate today's event. Thank you so much, Steve. Good afternoon and welcome to our colloquium on equity and the future of transportation. As most of you are aware, transportation inequities are a multifaceted issue extending beyond mere accessibility to encompass the environmental injustices they perpetuate. In many regions, highway and transportation infrastructure have been instrumental in segregating communities, particularly those belonging to marginalized populations through deliberate urban planning decisions. Simultaneously, these transportation arteries have become major sources of pollution, disproportionately impacting marginal, vulnerable neighborhoods that often bear the brunt of these environmental burdens. While the promise of efficient transportation is met for some, it exacts a heavy toll on others, deepening inequalities in mobility, public health, and economic opportunity. Today, we will hear from our esteemed panelists as they discuss what is required to address these inequities and what initiatives they have been working on tirelessly to create comprehensive and sustainable solutions that will improve all of our futures when it comes to mobility. I wanna go over a few logistics before we begin. You'll see that there's a white index card on your table. We're going to have a very lively Q&A portion of our program. And what we're gonna ask is that you write down your questions on the cards, they'll be collected and brought up to us and we'll ask the questions. For those of you online virtually, 
um, please put your question in the chat box and we will be monitoring the chat box and ask your question that way. And for my students that are here today, it is required that you all ask at least one question. And I see some former students and that's required of you too. So with that, I wanna introduce our first speaker, Tracy Strum Gilliam. And I wanna mention that Tracy flew out from the East Coast just to be with us today. Thank you so much. Tracy is a national expert in environmental justice analysis and outreach with more than 25 years of experience in transportation engineering and planning projects. Tracy is currently a senior director at PRR, where she is responsible for the East Coast transportation practice and serves as the firm's environmental justice practice lead. As a public involvement practitioner focused on grassroots outreach and consensus building, Tracy manages public involvement programs and conducts Title VI analysis, including the development of outreach programs to reach limited English proficient populations. She offers technical expertise in community impact assessment and conducts peer reviews for complex projects. Tracy led the public involvement program and environmental justice analysis task for the I-95 Access Improvement Study to support the $5.5 billion Port Covington Redevelopment Project. Tracy is a facilitator, speaker, research, and trainer, and has made notable contributions to the transportation equity space. She, Tracy is a member of the Women's Transportation Seminar, WTS, and we haven't talked about that in class, but that organization is wonderful. Um, for everybody here, and they also give scholarships, so we should talk about that next time. And um, Tracy is on board committees, tra transportation research board committees, such as equity and transportation, and community resources and impact committee. Tracy, I can't wait to hear your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, so I have 10 minutes, and I'm going to get you through the 10 minutes very quickly, but hopefully you will learn a good bit, and then we'll have questions on the back end for Q&A. And so the first thing I was asked to do today was to frame who I am and why I'm here. Why did I receive the invitation, right? And so as Sarah noted, I am an environmental engineer and planner uh, focused on in environmental justice, community impact assessments, NEPA analysis, Title VI analysis, et cetera, and why is that important? Uh, that is the, the fundamental block for how our communities are developed, right? So no major transportation project can take place in most states unless it's going through an environmental review process. The transportation decision-making decisions are made with the community when we're doing the work the correct way. And then as a part of our analysis, we should be understanding impacts potentially um, from a community impact assessment perspective that stops what is we're all focusing on now, which is reconnecting communities, right? Uh, had that work been done largely, we wouldn't have some of the inequities that are in place. Uh, the secondary element of that is making sure that we are doing that Title VI analysis and flow through, understanding the communities that need to be served and how we're connecting them. And that ties directly to the mobility challenge that we're talking about today. Okay, so moving on, PRR. How did I end up at PRR, the career that has expanded almost 30 years. I started fundamentally in engineering and planning. PRR is a communications and marketing firm. So why am I there? I'm there because their core sectors are transportation, environmental, and health. Those are all key to what I do on a daily basis in terms of my technical expertise. Um, and the importance there is recognizing how I got into community engagement to begin with. I was an engineer's engineer. I was working on watershed master planning. I was doing heck res modeling. I was in the field collecting water quality samples at 4.30 in the morning in wet weather events. And for a project, I had a project manager come to me and say, we had a very rough public meeting last night. You're the only black person on the team. Do you mind coming to the rest of the public meetings with us? And I was offended. In my world, I didn't sit in engineering school for five years to be reduced, I said in my world, right? I'm, I'm coming full circle, to be reduced to a person who had familiarity because of my race 
to be able to engage with another party. I attended the next public meeting and I was mortified. And when I returned to the office, I said, I don't know much about public input and engagement, but what I do know about being a human being with an experience and having a lived experience as a black woman, I know that you are not it. And I will take all the meetings that come from here on out. Um, and so that's important to understand while you're in your fundamental educational perspective right now is because these are the lessons that you get to figure out early on as you come into your career, as you establish workplace boundaries, as you identify who you are if you choose to stay in the academic space, right? How you uh, negotiate the research, who is the research being conducted on, and who are the diverse audiences that are conducting that research? That when you are bringing papers and posters and presentations to my committee at TRB, which I happen to co-chair with the Gloria Jeff, uh, it is technically AME 10, which is the Equity and Transportation Committee, you are thinking about research problem statements that move the needle, that embrace change, that are working for the better good of everyone. You also are writing papers from a position that you have an em empathetic and theoretical component of your work, that you understand that your voice is setting the framework for folks that are coming behind you that are going to use your text and your work, your body, your career as little footnotes as they prepare their own papers, presentations, and talking points. So, that's a bit about TRB and how can you help us best? Be engaged, whether it's my committee or others, we would love to see you researching, posi uh, positioning yourself, suggesting problem statements, and also being active in that particular community. So then the next piece is let's, let's focus on the technical work if I've answered and addressed the research, if I've answered and addressed how I ended up here. And that is from a very practical standpoint, the work that we do does three major things. We are identifying solutions for problems. We are engaging communities in that process. And we are developing infrastructure points that can be shared with others. And why is that important in this equity space? Well, one of the things that I've been really focused on lately has been on EV siting, the infrastructure investment. So just looking at the, um, the purchase rates of EV vehicles, one would say it's okay for us to avoid EV infrastructure in minority and low income communities. It is not, it is not. Because even if they only own 5% of the vehicles that are available, that's more than zero. Even if they only own 5% of the vehicles the communities in which they live are a part of the fabric of the cities in which we exist, right? And so that infrastructure siting is important, making sure that we do not create a network that leaves whole communities out of the process. The secondary piece of that is also understanding when I reference this re reconnecting communities piece, uh, USDOT just released the first round of funding for reconnecting communities grants. And so for those in the room that may not understand what that is, that is taking projects like the Highway to Nowhere in Baltimore that was supposed to connect Interstate 70 through Baltimore City, which took Senator Barbara Mikulski, who was not a senator yet, she was a field worker, and many community residents to literally lay their bodies on the line to stop that project. But what people don't talk about is the untold residual impacts, which is how I ended up doing community impact assessment work. The fact that over 8,000 families were removed from their homes without the access to generational wealth and were not compensated for that law, okay? Can you imagine now as the great-great-grandchild of a homeowner who lived in Sandtown, Winchester, whose community was changed forever? Why? Because a planner or an engineer sat at a desk somewhere, never had been in the community and said, it would be easier if we did this. So my goal today is to make sure to connect you to the work. It is not just about sitting behind a desk and figuring out the easiest, fastest, cheapest way 
to plan communities, to design infrastructure enhancements and improvements. It's really about putting yourself in the place of that person who lives there, in the place of that community that lives there, is understanding that we do have investments and we do need to make change. So the last piece, community impact assessments. Why is that great? When that work is done early, you get to understand what the needs are in a community. And that isn't just around infrastructure, it's also around services. So a big thing that's a part of my assessment when I go into a community, I'm not just thinking about transportation. I'm thinking about school placement. I'm thinking about food deserts. I'm thinking about daycare centers. I'm thinking about a dry cleaner. I'm thinking about walkability. I'm thinking about lighting. It's a huge thing in New Jersey. There is such a thing as light pollution. If I live in a community where the lights are on all the time and flooding, how does my brain settle? How do I properly rest and function? These are just a few of the things that are a part of that holistic space of assessing community impacts in a community. And finally, because I think I only have two minutes left, um, let's talk about mobility. And so in the equity space, when we talk about mobility, folks are often focused on uh, shared use vehicles, um, scooters, access to transit, um, and ADA services. But there is more than just that. It's also understanding where people need to go, not just for quality of life, but also for entertainment, uh, religious reasons, education, and work. And understanding that full uh, mobility compendium. And so when I look at equity elements in a community, I'm evaluating where do I live? Where would I like to live if I had a better job that paid me more that I could leave my community if I chose to? And if I chose to stay here, how do I navigate that community to be able to grow a family if I choose to have a family? If I choose to be a single household with just a dog, how do I have a full quality of life? How do I navigate that space on a daily basis and making sure that I'm having the interactions with folks that grow a full life? Um, the library, church, synagogue, et cetera. Um, quality of life spaces in terms of outdoor activity, et cetera. So those are the pieces that I'm thinking about. And then as I close out uh, my 10 minutes, and if you have questions for me, happy to take them in the Q&A, I want to challenge you from another perspective. Equity seems to be the buzzword. Um, and so much so that the name of our community committee was changed. Our TRB committee for many, many years was the Environmental Justice and Transportation Committee. It is possible to do two things at one time, the same way you can walk and chew bubble gum. You can be focused on equity and focused on environmental justice in Title VI as well. They are not mutually exclusive activities, right? And so you can amplify the environmental justice space. And why is that so important? Well, just focusing on equity alone doesn't get you the piece where we're focusing on in identifying and addressing disproportionate impacts. And that is what the environmental justice executive order does. It helps us with identifying and setting paper to pen uh, the disproportionate impacts on low income and minority populations. Why is that important? Title VI doesn't cover low income, but environmental justice does. All of it falls under an equity umbrella but it's important to understand the nuances um, and the work that you do. So in closing, thank you for being so gracious to host me today. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to address you. I want you to take away from this moment that we're focused on community. We're focused on people. We're focused on building sound communities that are livable, walkable, breathable, and free. That was fantastic, thank you, and all with no notes. Our next speaker is coming to us virtually. It's Jessica Medina. She joined LA Metro in 2021, and she brings a decade of experience in equity analysis, participatory planning, and environmental justice policies and programs. Jessica currently leads data and GIS programs for the Office of Equity and Race, and supports staff and other departments with identifying and testing equity metrics for project evaluation. 
Jessica's current and recent projects include updating Metro's equity focused communities map, creating an equity information hub that centralizes Metro's equity tools and information and supporting six teams piloting Metro's equity planning and evaluation tool, including the Long Beach East Los Angeles Corridor Mobility Investment Plan and the 2028 Mobility Concept Plan. Prior to joining Metro, Jessica worked with Ramey and Associates where she was part of a core team implementing SB 1000, a new policy requiring environmental justice analysis and engagement in local land use planning and with strategic concepts and organizing and policy education where she led environmental justice and equitable investment advocacy campaigns with community members and organizers and researchers. Jessica, are you here? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Um, hold on one second. We're just going to get you up on the screen. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, actually, I'm getting a message that I don't have permission um, to share my screen. If somebody could please help me with that. Yeah, it's it's still not working. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you for having me as well. Joining you from Los Angeles. Um, I will be talking to you about our efforts to advance equity within LA Metro, and I have a lot of content, so I might skip some of it. And you can take a look at it um, in the slides, which can be shared after and follow up with me with any questions of anything I didn't uh, touch on today. Um, so to start off with, I'm a manager in Metro's Office of Equity and Race. Uh, we're a small team of five at the moment, um, and we help across the entire agency with different types of initiatives uh, related to our equity implementation in specific I focus on data and mapping projects. So today I'll talk to you a little bit about our equity journey at Metro. Um, so where we started, where we are today, and some lessons that we've learned along the way. And then I'll introduce some of our assessment, engagement, and other related equity tools and resources that are available to you all if you would like to take a look um, on our Equity Information Hub, which is a new website we just launched in March. So before starting with our equity journey, I'm going to ground us a little bit in thinking about who we serve. Um, so LA Metro serves LA County as a whole, and it, you might have these stats yourself as students, but LA County at a glance is um, 10 million people over 3.5 million housing units. And then even though we have a median household income of 76,000, that means a lot of people are living below that. And so poverty rate is at 13.9% and unemployment at 5.4% as of earlier this year. But that obviously fluctuates over time and doesn't capture the entire picture of need. For us, when we think about putting people first. Our goal is really to make transit the first choice for transportation in Los Angeles. So we have a really huge responsibility of serving as a transportation planner, coordinator, designer, builder, and operator. We have over 11,000 employees. Um, a lot of those employees on, are in front, frontline roles as operators or maintenance technicians. Um, we also manage the nation's largest capital program and a $9 billion budget as of this fiscal year. And what we try to do to really put people first is engage community members, local leaders, and partner agencies in addressing some of the topics that our previous speaker touched on, because we know that all of those topics are cross-cutting and really impact, and mobility really is at the center of that. Um, more at a glance about us, you probably, when you hear about Metro, think about our bus and rail operations. We have a large system um, of over 120 routes, which is almost 12,000 stops over 1,500 square miles. 
Uh, we directly operate a fleet of 1,800 buses. Our metro rail system, as of June, this is not including any changes related to our um, regional connector that just opened earlier this year. Um, we have six lines, two heavy rail, four light rail, and those lines run across 108 stations. And within that, we have 100 heavy rail cars and 337 light rail cars. But what you might not know about Metro when you first hear about it is that we actually also have a broader multimodal approach to how we play a role in the mobility and transportation ecosystem locally. Uh, we, we fund municipal agencies directly. We fund bikeways and pedestrian facilities, Metro Micro, Bike Share, Express Lanes, and then the one that's very surprising to a lot of people, local roads and highway improvements, um, as well as all of these other topics and more. All of that to say that as we started on our equity journey, we recognize that there is a lot for us to consider and that the histories of not just Metro as an agency, but transportation and communities really required us to step back for a second and establish a framework for how we would address equity and meet our goals of serving people. So our equity platform was adopted in 2018 and has four pillars that we call them. Um, define and measure, focus and deliver, listen and learn, and train and grow. After adopting our platform, we adopted an equity definition, and I won't spend the time reading it to you today, but it really focuses on two core things. One is that we think about it not just as an outcome, but a process to address disparities, some of what you just heard about, um, but also we think about the outcomes that we want to see as opportunities and increasing access to jobs, housing, education, healthier communities. Again, some of what you just heard from our previous speaker. Since adopting our platform, we have been on a long equity implementation journey um, with our Office of Equity and Race being established in March, 2020. We have an equity liaison to working group, which is the way we train staff. We have a CBO partnering strategy, which provides direction for staff on how to partner equitably with different community-based partners. We have different assessment tools, including a rapid equity assessment tool and an equity planning and evaluation tool that are intended for different types of decisions. And we have an equity focused communities map which we've updated once since first adopting it in 2019. Lastly, we have started to integrate equity into our budget assessments over time. And all of these things have changed iteratively over the, the process of time. One other thing that we've done internally is, you know, understanding that we didn't all come to our planning careers or our careers at Metro with an intent to explicitly address equity or some of the historical harms that have been caused by public agencies. We started a book club, Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Jedi Book Club, that meets regularly and touches on different aspects related to equity, inclusion, diversity. Um, not pictured here, we have also started to look at how data and analysis like include certain biases that staff can be more aware of as they implement their projects. But our office hasn't been the only one to lead equity efforts at Metro. We recognize that even before we started, um, staff have implemented equity across projects, plans, programs, or policies, and we just haven't always called it equity work, right? So we do have some examples on screen. We try to look at different population needs, for example, understanding how women travel. We try to engage uh, different demographic groups that aren't as represented, such as youth, with our Metro Youth Council. And then we also consider outside of the data, you know, really finding ways to see our customers. And so some of that sometimes is translated through art and conveying that sense of belonging. What we learned along the way in the last five years is that 
we have to centralize information in easy to use formats in order to sustain a change within the agency, because that's really what's going to allow us to um, share the best practices that we're learning and really kind of build that culture from within of implementing the equity platform. So some sub bullets here of what we've learned is that the change is not going to be linear. It's iterative and requires commitments to partnership and learning. Um, staff turnover and team transitions do occur, which shift where institutional knowledge resides. So we kind of have to um, externalize that sometimes and put it in a place. And then lastly, community members, um, local leaders and partner agencies may be aware of and curious of our equity commitments, but unsure of how to find details. So what we took from these lessons learned in the five first five years um, of our equity platform is uh, an impetus to create an equity information hub, which is really our first centralized point of access for all of our equity related data and information. It just launched in March and we have a content library with some initial analyses and resources, but will be built out over the next couple of years with additional information that is already out there, but you know, it's the knowledge of it resides with different people. So we're hoping that this will help us support the implementation of our tools over the next five years and to also tell our story and encourage, encourage engagement um, with this content, not just from our customers, but from students and from partner agencies. So I'll stop here because I think I'm right at about 10 minutes. Um, but as I mentioned, this, this hub is very new. So when you get the presentation from us, you can take a deeper look into some of these tools that we have available, our equity focused communities, our CBO partnering strategy, um, our equity assessment and planning tools. And then something you won't find on the hub is our, our budget equity information, which as I mentioned is iterative um, and it's more recent, but these last couple of slides will give you a sense of how we're looking at assessing benefits to disadvantaged communities, but also more broadly, what are the benefits of our work? And lastly, what is it that we're gonna be working towards um, with some of the recently funded priorities in our latest fiscal year budget? Thank you, Jessica. That was really remarkable, especially amazing to see how much over the last few years Metro has taken the bull by the horn, so to speak, and just come up with all these tools. Also, I have um, a few students who are working on an equity project right now, and they may want to be in touch with you on some of the tools you all are putting together. So hopefully you'll be open to that. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Our next speaker is Dr. Elisa Borowski. Elisa joined UCI and the Institute of Transportation Studies just this last July. And she and Elisa jo joined as an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. As an infrastructure equity cluster hire in the Black Thriving Initiative, and Elisa's going to talk about that initiative. Their research focuses on social factors contributing to travel behavior and decision-making during mobility disruptions. Elisa's work uses mixed method approaches and advances in discrete choice modeling informed by social science theories to support social equity and resilience. Elisa received a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Northwestern University with a specialization in transportation systems analysis and planning, a master of science in civil engineering with focus on structures and materials and a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology with a second major in English from the University of New Mexico. Pretty impressive. Along with Tracy, Elisa is a member of the Transportation Research Board's Committee on Community Resources and Impacts and a former recipient of the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship. With that, I give you Elisa.
All right, can everyone hear me? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, thanks for taking the time to be here. Thank you, Director Dr. Steve Ritchie and Dr. Sarah Katz for inviting me to speak today. This is actually the first panel that I've ever been a part of, so I'm very excited and also nervous um, and honored to be, <laughs> uh, to be here among such um, expert panelists and also experts in the audience, I know. So, um, all right, so I'll get started. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about infrastructure equity and transportation engineering. I wanna start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, UC Irvine is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Ochiman and Tongva peoples. We respectfully honor and recognize the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, and we express our gratitude to live and work in these homelands. I'm framing my talk today around three imperatives that I'm identifying for a more equitable and uh, mobility future. So the first that I focus on is mitigating and preparing for climate change impacts. And this is looking more at distributional equity, um, but I also wanna talk about redistributing decision-making power and also embedding equity in educational and workforce development. And this is starting to talk more about procedural equity. Um, I imagine some people may want some sort of working definition for equity because it can be defined so many different ways. Uh, so for this talk, I'm using the definition from uh, People for Mobility Justice, which states that transportation equity refers to correcting past discrimination and how public transportation benefits and bur burdens are allocated, maintained, and developed. Those who have had the least should be given the most. So to start with mitigating and preparing for climate change impacts, I want to just lay out a few disparities uh, and the interactions between those disparities, especially here in the California context. So we have acute and chronic climate disasters such as extreme heat, flooding, drought, sea level rise, and wild wildfires. There is There are disparities in exposure to environmental harms such as air pollution, drinking water pollution, heat island effect, and living in close proximity to power plants, oil refineries, and landfills. And there are also systemic injustices that we know about, the racial wealth gap, redlining practices, and there's even intergenerational and collective trauma that accumulates from our history of discrimination and oppression in this country. So some of the prior research that I did uh, I went with my PhD, I was looking at different ways that people use transportation and also social elements of transportation to access different needs. So I looked at how people used crowd shipping, especially lower income households used crowd shipping to access food during the COVID-19 pandemic. I looked at how older adults uh, in neighborhoods in Chicago that were primarily black and African American or Latino and Hispanic, how they accessed or had burdens to accessing healthcare. Um, I looked at how young adults were accessing social support during the initial uh, COVID-19 pandemic lockdown and then also looking at how people who don't have cars access evacuation during a flood event. Um, so I'm really just beginning my uh, research here at UC Irvine, but I've been fortunate to receive funding to start on a project right from the beginning, um, which is looking at transit integration with community resilience centers here in California as a form of social infrastructure for hazard preparedness. Um, and I'm very thankful to uh, UCITS and Remy for funding this work and also to my graduate students and undergraduate students who are helping me, uh, Janine, Montana, and Preston, who are here, thank you, um, for the work that you're doing on this. So we're focusing on what is the first, maybe officially named Resilience Hub in LA, Boyle Heights uh, Arts Conservatory. This was developed by a nonprofit that we're partnering with, Climate Resolve. Um, and this resilience hub is located a bit away from uh, Metro's rail transit. And we're interested in how, what transit agencies are doing to help people who need help getting to these resilience hubs, access resilience hubs during extreme events like extreme heat events. So for the sake of time, we'll move on to redistributing uh, decision-making power. 
So one of the ways we can do this is through the planning process. Uh, Veronica Davis recently published this book, Inclusive Transportation, and in it she defines two steps to measuring transportation equity. Um, so she says the first is to analyze the history of the community and then to work with the community to develop the metrics that lead to restoration, which really only that community can articulate. So I think in engineering, um, this is kind of a frustrating answer that the metrics actually depend uh, they change on a case-to-case -case basis. They depend on the community that uh, you're working with. And so what this means for us, I think as researchers, um, is that we need community-led research collaborations. And we also need to work on, I think, our mixed method analyses to figure out how we can bring in this history, this culture, these narratives into our analysis frameworks um, so that we can better uh, account for these, these really important aspects. And I also wanted to take a moment to um, plug that at, if you're going to be at the TRB annual meeting this uh, upcoming January, I'm helping organize a workshop on um, vital signs of the livable community and quality of life paradigms, where are we now? So in this workshop, we will be exploring other types of metrics um, for the outcomes of projects on livability and quality of life. Another important way to redistribute redistribute power is through mobility itself. Um, so there's uh, work out there, theoretical work such as um, by people such as Amy Scheller, looking at how by commoning mobility itself and creating these shared spaces of movement, um, we can create more sustainable mobility, but it's also a way to undermine the uneven spatially and different, uh, differential mobility power. Um, that's legacy of, of racial capitalism and colonialism. So when we think about who has access to mobility, it's also who has access to power. And as we make decisions about who gets this access, we're also kind of controlling who has access to power. So this is really important, something that we all um, are contributing to, and I think we should all be thinking about. So the last point is embedding equity in education and workforce development, um, because education is often the guardrails of any profession. So it really starts uh, with education. So I'm going to be talking about the UCI Black Thriving Initiative, which is what I was hired into. Um, this is a really uh, powerful mission, so I am going to read through it um, because I think it's really important that we're all aware of it. So this is from the website. Um, the pervasiveness of anti-Blackness in society demands the attention of the entire research and creative enterprise of the university. This imperative requires a comprehensive, comprehensive approach to advancing the understanding of the Black experience and the drivers of well being for this population. It relies on the existing infrastructure while purposefully leveraging institu institutional resources to fundamentally understand and accelerate change. And to this end, the campus will elevate attention, intensify effort, and disseminate knowledge and creative expressions that refute anti Blackness promote innovative public policy solutions to structural racism, and yield practical benefits to Black communities locally, regionally, and nationally. So the Black Thriving Initiative also had this faculty cluster hiring program, where it's um, bringing in 12 new faculty across the entire campus. Um, and it's, it has three main clusters. So the first is, in no particular order, um, environmental health disparities, um, and this includes Shakira Hobbs and Sibylin Environmental Engineering, who some of you may know, among uh, other faculty in family medicine and environmental and occupational health. It includes also poetic justice uh, with faculty from the Department of Art and Anthropology, as well as infrastructure equity, uh, which includes Dominic, myself, and Vina, which I'll be, I'll be talking about our work on the following slide. Um, and there are more. Um, these are just from a recent lunch event that we had, but people are still being hired. Uh, there should be four in each cluster. So in terms of infrastructure equity, um, the focus of this cluster is to address social, environmental, and racial disparities in infrastructure planning, design, and implementation through research and engagement. Dominic Bedner um, is an assistant professor in urban planning and public policy, and his work examines uh, equitable pathways for decarbon decarbonization of energy infrastructure, workforce development in black and brown communities, and the equity implications of household energy assistance programs. Vina du Dubal is a professor of law, and her work focuses on examining social, economic, and technical, technological infrastructures, including discriminatory labor practices uh, within transportation and mobility firms, and the land use and equity impacts of emerging mobility systems on historically Black communities in San Francisco. 
and then my work, which I have already discussed a bit for the sake of time. Uh, I'll move to the closing remarks. Um, I didn't know how to end this presentation, so I decided to pull a quote from Adrian Marie Brown, which I think has interesting implications in a transportation context. Uh, so they state, many of us have been socialized to understand that constant growth, violent competition, and critical mass are ways to create change. But emergence shows us that adaptation and evolution depend more upon critical, deep, and authentic connections, a thread that can be tugged for support and resilience. The quality, it's the quality of connections between the nodes. Thank you. That was great. Um, I, during q and I want to ask you some more questions about the initiative, but this is the first time I'm hearing about it, so I'm loving it. Our next speaker came in and in, in a pinch and helped us because as Dr. Ritchie mentioned, Joe Demento was unable to join us today. So Johnny Dunning Jr. from OCTA, which is the Orange County Transportation Authority, um, is, is our next speaker. And thank you so much, Johnny, appreciate that. <clears throat> Johnny is a career transit professional with over 25 years experience in transit system planning and operations at both small and large multimodal properties. He joined the OCTA team in February, 2017. As the chief operating officer and a bus rider, Johnny is responsible for leading OCTA's operation teams, including bus, rail, which includes commuter and streetcar, the streetcar will be launched early next year, paratransit, microtransit, mobility management, and vehicle and facilities maintenance. Prior to arriving at OCTA, he served as the manager of service implementation with the North County Transit District, NCTD, and as the senior director of transit system planning with the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, also known as MARTA. Johnny's experience includes overseeing expansion plans, service planning and scheduling for bus and rail services, policy development, community outreach and engagement, special projects, and contract oversight of ADA paratransit service. So as you can see, Johnny's a bit busy. With that, I'll give you Johnny. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, as I started listening to what she was saying and all the things that were said, I started to wonder who was she talking about? <laughs> um, but again, thank you for the invitation. And it's great to be on this uh, panel of esteemed colleagues. Uh, I listened to all of you, even uh, Jessica, and what you said is very weighty. And I'm not going to add to what you said. It speaks a lot. And uh, just a privilege to be on the panel with you today. And Sarah, thank you uh, once again to work with you. I, I, Sarah is definitely an advocate for transportation, specifically public transportation. I just thank you for your support and, and inviting me here today. Again, um, yes, I want to remind you that uh, typically when we come out, we use the, we're our, the home system. You heard about LA Metro and you hear about, you know, what's going on in UCI and then a national approach, uh, but we're your home system, OCTA. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we're probably supposed to bring you some swag and I don't have a lot of swag today, but I'll have you some pens, some pens. You already have pens, but we have pens for you today. All right. So I'll try to improve on that next time. But I, I only have 10 minutes and I'm gonna have to shoehorn a lot of stuff in here. Um, I'm gonna put my, my timer on to keep me on track. Uh, again, we're, I'm representing the Orange County Transportation Authority and it is our vision to provide an integrated and balanced transportation system to support the diverse travel needs and reflect the character of Orange County. And we do that every day by delivering and developing solutions uh, that meet uh, the needs and improve the, enhance the quality of life and keep Orange County moving. Uh, that's our, our our vision and our mission. And um, I think I have my presentation up. Yes. Sorry, I'm let you come in. Yeah. Um, but I can I can, I can continue to report that. Um, as mentioned, I began my career about 20 years. Oh, okay. um, and um, I'm an Orange County boy. I went to elementary school, elementary school, and high school. I had to go to college and matriculate. I, I had to get out on some stuff going on in the world. So I had to go, I had to leave. And I, I went down to Louisiana, uh, got my degree in civil engineering, 
you know, being, uh, I didn't have enough of being a student all my life. Um, I pursued a master's degree at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. And after that, immediately, um, I caught on an internship with, with, uh, with Marvin, and the rest was history. I got my first job there, and I was there for 14 years. And then I came back home, California in 2012, where I had a job at North County Transit District in North County, San Diego. And then about six years ago, I came to OCTA, and uh, I've been there for about almost, almost seven years. So with that, again, I started my career as a plan. And so right now, in terms of equity and equality and all that, and just being fair and just, uh, it's evolved for me over time. This picture kind of encapsulates my transition of thought because back in 1998, when I came in as a transit, plan transit planner, I was all about equality, right? And and you, But you can see that having that mindset is a little myopic and it doesn't really meet the community need, right? Because at the end of the day, <laughs> We're good on time. No questions. I'm not on me. Oh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> well, as you said, we've been there together. I felt like there's a plan. And again, and again, I think about equality. And it's funny because I was here as a senior planner at Mark, and one of my first projects was implementing so a and we were service plan. And we were service plan that consists of the future. And I remember in my church. Uh, and so we go to the community and we present this plan and we were expressed and we were told them to do it. And so we have a band that stands up and says, Well, I'm just supposed to be impact. So I came about supposed to be an impact by the same time. And we were so that we can get the community to impact us to be part of the country with this great impact. And it's like, okay, well, if we do this, do that, but we're gonna just we're going to basically roll out that they said, okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna push you guys to that. Get the money from the left, right? And what happened was they said, Hey, this is a problem. It's like, Okay, so I said, Okay, how is this done? They said, Well, we have to be this two and a half hours. We were two and a half hours. We were looking at a percentage here, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that means that next year we have a micro on us in terms of, you know, how are we compliant with the law? And how do we really need to do that first? And we come up with this. Uh, down and people can be successful still with it next year. And you can have the same thing. And so really the first part of my career is about being equal and complying with, with uh, Title VI and the environmental justice we really don't care. Title VI is just legislative to kind of make sure that people are considering when you need to need to uh, a folks based on race, right? You know, nature poison and, and, and pollution and all that sort of thing. But if we can deal with the with the money and the cost and that sort of thing, that's what environmental justice is, right? If I spent the first five years of my career building stuff, not to mention that was a writer as well, I could see it for myself. Right? But over time, you know, this whole definition changed. It says that equality is one thing, but equity is another thing, as you see here. And, and, and myself and even OCT, we have our approach where it's not about equality. It's about it's it's about equity. It's about making sure that you offer the resources to those who have may have a different type of need. Right, so so that means it may be more critical uh, funding. It may be more um, investment in the community, more engagement, more digging, and trying to find out what exactly is going to be the right ride for the traveling public. Um, I kind of trying to remember my slides now, um, but but no, but no to to save time. One of the things that I also figured out was the fact that that when we're planning, you know, we tend to kind of just check the box check the box. And since it's mandated, it's more like, you know, hey, we just, did we get this done? Did we get this done? Did we get that done? And move on. But you're not thinking about the quality of the context of the stage you're in, especially public engagement, right? Thank you so much. Um, so we were just interested in, you know, checking the box, make sure that we, you know, met our, met our mandate, right? And so um, we got over all the buzzwords. And so it became more like divine, defining diversity. Who are we really meeting? Who was really disenfranchised? Because we know now it's not just color anymore. 
you know, you got folks who are who are, are seniors, you got those who are disabled, you have all these things out there that you have to think about in terms of meeting everyone in your community. And Orange County is very, very diverse. And what was befuddling to me is the fact that we're talking about equality and implying with Title VI and environmental justice. And where am I? I'm in Atlanta at this time. Atlanta. I don't know if you guys know, but Atlanta is like the bedrock of the civil rights movement. I mean, it's 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 Martin Luther King's birth, birth city, birth home, right? And we're talking about being equitable in Atlanta, Georgia, are you kidding me, right? So so there are some generational challenges there. It's like we still haven't gotten it right. And, and, and I think it's because we have a checkbox mentality and it's not, it's like checking the box and what's legislated, but you can't legislate a mindset. It's a mindset. You have to be thinking about, hey, look, when we are in the conceptualization phase, when we're in the planning phase, right? When we're in the design phase, you got to be thinking about who you're going to impact. What our issue was was we were we were um, we would go through the conceptualization, the planning, and the design, and, and then we would go to the public. What do you think, right? We go back and make make you know make these changes or whatever whatnot just to placate our board, right? And sometimes our board didn't have um, a choice because it was a financial question or it was a financial issue, so they had to go ahead and make the choice where we impacted a lot of people, as opposed to having the mindset. Or, or the discussion and engagement with the public up front, up front, and having the mindset on who are all, who are gonna to be totally impacted by this plan that we're talking about. So you have to engage the stakeholders early on. A lot of folks don't wanna do that, especially planners, because we're like, well, we have an objective, we have a budget, we have you know, uh, you know, a system we have to develop. And if, we have, if it's too plural, if it's too many people, we're never gonna get it done. And that's the fear, but that, that, that goes back to you planners saying, hey, look, this is what we have to do. You paint the vision. You tell them there are going to be some casualties. There are going to be some things. We can't do it for everybody, but what can we do with what we have? And when you have that discussion up front, then it helps you down toward the end. So when you go to the board, it really is a kumbaya, and we all agree with it. Yeah, we're going to take some losses here or there, but at the end of the day, this is what's best for the public, right? Um, and here, uh, Secretary Buttigieg uh, said it, but the point now where we are, it's not just big bucks. Right uh, to be equity and to be equitable, um, we got to consider what is the right ride. What is the right ride for the traveling public or for anyone? And right now, you all know that we operate big bus, forty foot bus, which is like the Rodney Dangerfield. I'm dang dating myself. It's like the Rodney Dangerfield of public transportation. It carries the most people, but gets no respect. People want to ride a train, but they never want to ride a bus. Right? Um, you know, we, we we operate paratransit service. We operate. Um, OC Flex, which is a demand response service, again, trying to find the right ride, and pretty soon OC Streetcar. We also have regional rail. So my computer went out here. Uh, let me go back there. Let me, let me go back there. Thank you. Um, but um, again, the point of transit is not to have a bus. The point of transit is getting people where they need to be. So public transportation, it's multimodal. And, and that's what we've come to understand. That's what I've known since I was in college. It's the same thing. And again, it's the mindset. You know, it's, it's generational challenges uh, challenge the industry. It's always been the same. But to me, I think the key is trying to get the right mindset. And my mindset now has transformed from thinking equality to equity. Um, I'll leave you with this. These are some of the things that OCTA is doing right now. Uh, we're definitely engaging the community. That's one thing that's the stable right now is to engage the community. And this, this year shows you what we're doing. And it's not only our market, right, and the people we're serving, but it's also the employees, right? The employees have diverse needs too. And so what do we do to attract an, an, you know, an employee and employee workforce that's going to you know, keep us on the, the planning side? Uh-oh, sorry. I got some time because they were kind of some, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we, we look at our workforce as well. So when people are coming in, we it's diverse, it's equitable, it's inclusive, and we 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 put a B on ours, D E I B, belonging. You have a sense of belonging to the organization, right? Uh, so it, it's internal reflection and employee engagement, which is essential to inclusion and belonging. Um, and we have to listen to the the community. And, and the, 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 the needs and um, the, the, the traveling needs and all those things are very important to these diverse communities, right? Um, but we all have one goal and that is to keep Orange County moving. We have to listen to them too. We can't just go out and just say, hey, look, you know, you're here, you're commenting. We take your comment, we're gonna put it down, but at the end of the day, this is what we're gonna do. No, you have to listen, incorporate, and kind of have a discussion with them and saying, okay, that's possible and say yes and, or say, you know, this is the reason why because of this and there are trade-offs. So it has to be a discussion. 
right? And the discussion requires listening. Uh, and we're going to prioritize what equity is. There's even there are there are going to still be some decisions between what is equitable, but we have to be able to prioritize those to be able to move forward with a plan that's appropriate, uh, that meets the, the traveling need, but also can fit in with our budget. And we have to engage stakeholders and public input, which drives our decision making process. When we go to our board and make a decision, our board always wants to know what does the public think, and and is this the right thing to do, right? And you know, uh, a lot of times. There are things that we have to decisions we have to make that impact the the paratransit population and, uh, or, or those who are disabled and that sort of thing and we have to go back and we have to reassess and sometimes we have to really change our plan because at the end of the day if you're impacting them they're going to be the ones lined up with wheelchairs and canes and everything else coming to our board saying hey don't do this right but we don't want to get it to that point we want to already have addressed those issues and make sure that we are meeting their need and it drives what we decide on uh, at OCTA and our board of directors. So I know I shoehorned it, but I look forward to the discussion. I know you're going to have a lot of questions, and I look forward to that. And that concludes our, my, my points that I want to make. We understand our mics now will be live. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, all three of you, all four of you, Jessica, Ivy, and Vaughn online to answer any questions. If you wouldn't mind writing your questions and passing them down and then maybe somebody could volunteer to bring them up to me, that would be wonderful. But while you're doing that, I wanna introduce somebody and embarrass him a little bit. Um, Professor Mike McNally, raise your hand. Um, Mike is in the Institute of Transportation Studies and Civil Engineering. Some of you may be in his son's cohort, Max. Any of you know Max? Are you hearing this, Mike? Max got a. No. I was just going to. I was just going to ask you to talk about the classes you're going to be teaching the next couple of quarters because many of my students have taken them and love them. Uh, yeah. What happens if we go to the ICF one class? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it all depends on the class. Some of them can go in and Well, some of the people are taking the class course in public transit, especially the efficient teaching. Um, no problem. No problem. No problem. Yeah. I'm sure there's another one that can take more for city teaching. Some courses that do have math in it, that's not the the learning outcome. So it's the application of the math outcome. So give it a try. Give it a try. Um, my courses, all my courses are online. I have a lot of courses, and I have a good one that I can just run through. But do not call me. <laughs> all right, erase the number I just sent you. Yeah. <laughs> when did you call? I don't answer. <laughs> In any event, thank you. And and Mike was and Max was signed up for our class, but got a TA position and then ended up choosing TA over over this class. Oh well. Wait, TA might not. Be. I know. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, our first question is for Tracy. Can you discuss the impacts of the cancellation and then reinstatement of the red line, the routes being planned, and accessibility and equity needs that it would support? access to jobs for communities not prioritized in the past. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna unpack, but just Sarah, just if I missed something, just point and let me, and let me know the steps that I missed. So um, the fact that someone in this room actually knew about Baltimore Redline or online is amazing. So I worked on Redline 1.0 for about 10, 10 or 12 years. Um, and I was the environmental justice analysis lead um, and the community outreach lead. And I was on the NEPA writing team. We received 
uh, accolades from FTA uh, for the EJ methodology and the outreach program that ensued. Um, as a part of that process, we structured a full team, which included public meetings, a red line internship program, a uh, citizens advisory committee, which was um, appointed and shaped by the, the governor at the time, but we also had a local station area advisory committee. Um, there were 15 station area advisory committees, of which I served as a facilitator for uh, one of those. Um, and then of course we had a website program, et cetera. So that particular project for Redline, the 14.1 mile corridor uh, connecting East and West Baltimore through the, the downtown hub, um, with a station, final terminus stops at uh, Centers for Medicaid um, on the west side and Johns Hopkins Bayview on the east side of Baltimore. Now, why is that important? Remember when I was speaking and I referenced the Highway to no Nowhere, uh, which is the US 40 di uh, ditch segment, which is also uh, the recipient of a recent Reconnecting Communities grant. Um, and so uh, that particular corridor um, is the home of much uh, angst in terms of the infrastructure uh, that is there. And um, remember I was talking about the communities for highway to know, nowhere that were removed um, from the, the, the community fabric. And so in terms of the question about uh, in engaging community members uh, that might've been left behind and before, uh, those communities as a part of Redline 1.0 uh, were engaged in the process. Um, I will I will say this early on in the process, um, the engagement was typically a public meeting that was advertised in the paper that may be the extent of it. Um, we were able to change that narrative through the institution of the SAC program, the CAC, and all the in-community outreach that was done. We also had Redline Community Liaisons. It's a group of seven individuals. Uh, that attended and hosted over 200 events in the community. And that's everything from community cleanups and walks to jazz nights. Um, and that's much of the same um, process that we're following right now, except for we don't have formal liaisons and ambassadors. Um, I happen to be one of the segment leads in Redline 2.0 um, in assisting with the engagement for uh, that process. Um, the second tier was after engagement was about the routes being planned. The routes being planned. So um, in coming back, there are were a lot of questions around, well, why can't you just stop where you start where you stop? And we can't from the standpoint that when um, the former governor canceled the project that nullified that funding, that funding was given to other projects. Um, and two, we do not have an active record of decision, which is a part of that NEPA process that we talked about. I also conducted the community impact assessment um, for Redline 1.0. So um, that needs to come back. And so the mode has not been chosen. Uh, MTA is still evaluating uh, light rail transit as well as bus rapid transit. And of course, a no bill scenario has to be a part of the process just following NEPA. Um, and then the route alignments are mixed um, with a mix of tunnel and surface sections, um, but typically follow that same security bar, Cooks Lane, US 40, through the dish segments through downtown to East Baltimore. And the next one was? <laughs> no, no, on that same question. I, I know. Okay. The routes being planned and accessibility okay, and city needs that it can support access to jobs for communities not prioritized. Okay, access to jobs. So part of the whole framing um, for logical termini and purpose and need, which is a part of the also the NEPA process for those that are not familiar um, with how funding uh, in NEPA is structured, is uh, around job access and not only access to jobs, but access to educational opportunities and housing, et cetera. Um, the impetus for the red line was a reduction in travel time uh, to do that east-west transition, which right now, um, before the quick bus was instituted, took about four uh, bus transfers and was almost an hour and a half travel time in the red line, anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half travel time. And the red line um, travel time estimates in red line 1.0, they have not been calculated for red line 2.0, so do not quote me on this, was to get that commute time down to 51 minutes. 
uh, east to west travel. So that was a part of it. The workforce development program, we actually had started instituting a workforce development program in, in addition to the training program that I talked about, the educational internship program for three area high schools that are located along the corridor um, in making sure that fo folks had access to job training assistance, uh, construction jobs and the green ecosystem in the Baltimore tech community. And many of those things I'm sure will come back. I cannot speak to what will happen in 2.0 because we just relaunched in June. Did I miss anything? Yeah. Okay. So one of the pieces before I wrap up, because other people have questions, there are two documents that I do want you all to pull that will help support this framework and many of the uh, elements that were a part of my uh, presentation or talk. Um, one, um, I had the, the privilege and the honor of, su of supporting Secretary Buttigieg and his office of civil rights in writing the USDOT's uh, 2022 guide. It is called, excuse me, uh, Promising Practices for Addressing Transportation Decision Making and, um, and as a, in, in public involvement. And part of that piece was also being able to lead the training program for it. So that is a guide that you do want to pull. It's the first time that USDOT has written a guide that is not only for practitioners, it's for the community, and it is for folks that are sitting making these decisions and funding decisions, right? The other one is the 2018 update. It is uh, the Community Impact Assessment Quick Reference Guide. I had the privilege of writing that. Um, with ICF and Ann Morris in 2018. Um, they're also known as the Purple Books, and that lays out the process for how you answer some of these questions about placement, zoning, um, community engagement, design, um, and impacts, potential impacts for com to communities before we get to a final de design process. And that is 2018. It was written, it was written for FHWA. Beautiful. Thank you. Our next question is for Jessica. This person really appreciated Metro's presentation and wants to know how does your equity plan integrate with Metro All Hazards plan, considering vulnerable populations have different mobility challenges? Thank you, Sarah. I, I'm not sure what that plan is, but if I had to guess it's a hazard and mitigation plan, can the person confirm? It's the plan around Metro's needs during a hazard. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, Metro's plan itself, but I have worked on hazard, I have worked on hazard and mitigation plans before. Um, so I'm familiar with the methodology of how those communities typically get identified. So our equity focused communities map, um, and I got into this in the Q&A on Zoom a little bit, where it only considers three indicators. Um, we look at low income households, zero vehicle households, and BIPOC population, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, and where we started with identifying priority communities with the EFC map was that our we had a policy advisory council that looked at dozens of indicators. So some of them typical of what would be considered in a hazard and mitigation plan related to climate change um, and risk. And they decided over time, uh, just looking at that data, that it would be better to focus on the top three um, criteria that kept coming up over and over whenever you think about a social issue or specifically a transportation issue, which is, you know, people that don't have access to vehicles, um, they're most likely impacted. And so if you look at that population, my guess is it's probably going to overlap a lot with uh, people who are at higher risk or might not have access to the resources to kind of be mobile during a climate emergency or other natural risk. Um, the second one, uh, the concentration of BIPOC populations in a census tract also, for a lot of the reasons that have been shared by the other speakers, often will overlap with other indicators of equity need, as well as climate risk um, or the need for consideration in a, in a plan that touches on the hazards. Um, and then lastly, the 
low income households, um, similarly to those other two, they found that if you looked at that population and where specifically those census tracts kind of light up when you look at a map of Los Angeles County, oftentimes it's gonna overlap with a lot of places that don't have infrastructure. Um, so a lot of our low income communities don't have the, the infrastructure that is gonna help them be mobile during a climate emergency. Um, and at the same time, a lot of these uh, communities have been kind of split apart by a history of highway planning, for example. And so even though they might have access to a freeway, uh, you might not be able to get on it because it's gonna be congested during an emergency. So this is a kind of a roundabout way of saying that um, I, I'm sure there is a lot of overlap between what's identified in the hazards plan, um, but it won't be exactly the same. And we always tell staff, you know, our EFC map is only the beginning. You have to look at other project specific data or topic specific data, and you have to do the engagement on the ground to identify what are the needs. So hopefully that provides a satisfactory answer without my having the knowledge of that other plan. I think it does. I just got a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this next question is for Elisa. Can you outline further about your research on how, <clears throat> me, on how mobility solutions are affecting primarily Black communities? Um, yes. So the best I can speak to on this right now is from my dissertation research. So my first project here at uh, at UC Irvine is not looking at a, a primarily black neighborhood. It's a primary, primarily a Latino and Hispanic neighborhood. Um, during my PhD research, I um, did focus groups with a variety of neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, and the one that was a primarily black neighborhood uh, was Washington Park. And we met with older adults there asking about uh, what barriers they experienced to accessing healthcare um, in terms of transportation. Um, and so I think through that work, that was the first time I had experience with community engagement work. Um, so I learned a lot about the process. Um, and the the very, I guess, multi-layered um, experience or, or process in terms of identifying what the barriers are and working towards solutions. And um, that work is primarily a qualitative analysis. So we did a thematic analysis uh, to identify what the, the main themes were that, that older adults were talking about. And um, they, they fell into uh, categories uh, around um, physical transportation. So not having access to um, well, unreliable buses was was a was a big one, and also not having uh, a bench to sit on, and not knowing how long uh, to wait for the wait for the bus the next bus was going to be. Um, a lot of uh, challenges around ADA accessibility and just bus drivers who might surpass just drive past someone because they didn't want to go through the trouble of stopping um, and and taking the extra time uh, to assist them. Um, so those were the transportation challenges in that particular neighborhood. And there were also, we asked about a virtual um, solutions. So is, is telehealth a, a good solution for this population? And in some ways uh, it might be good for, for some things, um, but there are still a lot of barriers in terms of uh, the accessibility of technology, especially among older adult population. Um, and then a, a big challenge that was a little out of our scope was, um, access to information in a way that felt accessible and, and made sense uh, to the people who needed that information, especially around insurance and benefits. Um, and there were language barriers and there was just um, a lot of confusion around who to ask to get the information needed. So um, I don't, yeah, that's a very, it's a very specific project that I'm focusing on uh, now. So I don't have a, big picture solution, a big picture answer to your question, um, but that's some of the research that I've done so far. Thank you. And this question is specifically for Johnny, and it's more, it's a question about public engagement. So Tracy, if you have anything you want to add, feel free to, or Jessica. How do you get public engagement if the public doesn't trust that the OCTA will carry out their feedback? 
good question. And I think if the trust or the mistrust is there, that means there must have been a history of, of not delivering. So again, it goes with the same approach of uh, going deeper into the community, finding the right forms, because there are a lot of folks who sometimes when you have your traditional uh, public hearing, a lot of times you have your public hearings at what, five to seven, six to eight. Some people who are working second and third shifts who ride your service can't make that meeting. So, so you have to kind of really dig deep to figure out how you're going to reach those folks. So that's the first thing is developing trust and you want to hear them. Um, because in the past, it was very superficial. You had your block meeting and you didn't get all the participants there. So at the end of the day, when these changes go forth, they think that you're looking out for their best interest, but you're not, but they never had your input to consider. Um, that's the first thing. Um, another thing too is the fact that just because we're engaging you and you come with your specific comment, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to acquiesce and give you what you need. If that's the case, we'll be giving these to everyone and we wouldn't have a system that would be efficient because we're trying to meet everyone's need. So there's going to sometimes be a, you know, a polite no. And with that, what you do is you kind of provide a reason or rationale as to why you can't do it. Case in point, when I was in Georgia, we had, like my last year I was there, we had a major service change. We were, we were going from a, we all remember the recession, right? Uh, 2007, 2008, right? Uh, the, the Great Recession. And it caused MARTA to have to really reduce its service uh, from 125, 130 routes down to about 98 routes. A significant service change. And we're out there and I'm out there in the crossfire and I'm out there in the on the battleground with the public. And I call it the battleground because they were really kind of, what are you guys doing to us? And uh, a gentleman came and said, you know, you make the service change, you know, I remember specifically, he said, you make this service change, it's going to cause me to have to walk an additional third of a mile to the rail station. And I'm like, okay, I got you. We'll kind of see how this impacts your, you know, you, you, you know, improves. It, it kind of impacts your trip because you're walking a little further, acquires more time. And so he's standing right here. Another young lady comes and she says, uh, this service change is going imp <clears> to, <throat> it's going to impact me because I have a child that I'm trying to get uh, to, to, to daycare. And if you take my route, I'm going to have to have my stroller in the street. In Georgia, you all know, it's not sidewalk like California. So she's in the street with her stroller, and I'm going to have to walk a half mile to get to my bus stop because you're taking my bus away from over here. And as she's sharing this with me, the gentleman over here who heard it said, you know what? I retract my comment because he saw that it was for the greater common good. He felt that, hey, look, I can walk the additional third of a mile if you would keep her service where it is. So really, it gets down to digging deep and working with the public, realizing there are going to be some casualties that the gentleman was a casualty with his request because he couldn't get it. He's going to have to walk an additional third of a mile. But at the end of the day, you really preserve service for this individual. He needs it more than he does. Everybody needs to ride the service. But at the end of the day, you have to trust them. If we are transparent with you and telling you why we can't do it, that builds the trust. And trust me, there are going to still be some folks who tell you, I don't like this. I don't like it. And you're not going to meet their need. But at the end of the day, I don't like it, but I accept it. And, and that's something that we as plant, well, I'm not a planner anymore, but at, you're always a planner. Let me just make that straight. If, if you guys have a day planner, if you're an outlook, if you're setting a schedule, you are a planner, okay? But but planning, you never lose. And 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 since I've come to operations, I'm the chief operating officer, I still have a planning background. And, and, and gauging the public is very, very important to me. And I think the digger you deep, the digger you deep, uh, the, 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 the deeper you dig, excuse me, uh, and the more you establish that trust, especially if there's a history, uh, it's about really being honest and being transparent. And I think the industry is evolving and being a little more transparent. It's a little more painful when you have to engage the public. And I think the panelists can agree with that. But uh, building trust is key. So hopefully I answered the question. Yeah. And I'll just add two points. I, I think the, the first thing that Johnny brought to the table as he uh, attempted to answer the question is the humanistic side. Um, being a thought leader that has compassion and empathy and the technical skills and the financial wherewithal to make decisions that matter and count uh, that comply and provide a holistic system. But first and foremost, being a human being and understanding the context in which we are working. The second um, is not just digging deep, but owning 
the mistakes of the past. And I think for a lot of communities, just being able to hear, we apologize for the decisions that were made before I got to this particular seat, before I before I joined this role, before I joined this, this conversation with you is important. Um, and then finally, just recognizing, as Johnny discussed, it's not just about public meetings. It's using the whole toolbox, which is why I think it's so important that folks download that guide that I spoke to you about or any other resource um, and just recognizing that it's about public meetings, it's about pop-ups, it's about visualizations, it's about gaming tools to help people understand if I have $10 and real cost five, <laughs> but I still need to maintain the system, pay the staff and think about future improvements, that leaves me $2 left. What do I do with the extra two? It can be just that simple in, in terms of making sure that people understand um, and that are involved in the conversation, understanding the decision make, this, this, this decision making framework um, in which we are working. That's great. Elisa, well, this is, it says Tracy and Elisa, but I'm going to have Elisa answer first. You both mentioned solving the inequity problem needs to work with communities on a case-by-case -case basis. Solving the inequity problem needs to work with communities on a case-by-case -case basis. Does it mean we cannot come up with a holistic framework to solve the equity issue? Okay, I'll try to go first. Um, I think I'm stuck on the, the phrase solve the equity issue. I think maybe it was Jessica's presentation uh, where, where she said that this is more of a process than an outcome. Um, so I don't know that, I don't think that we'll come up with a framework that solves equ inequities forever. Um, but but I think a framework for the process uh, is achievable. And um, can you read the question one more time, sorry? Yeah. It's basically, does it mean we cannot come up with a holistic framework a holistic to solve the equity issue? Because it's a case-by-case -case basis. Right. No, I think that the framework can be general enough that that it can be adaptable uh, to the needs of a community. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm gonna stop there. I don't know, I wanna hear what Tracy has to say. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, the, there, I think a framework can exist. Um, I think what is important is that we also discuss what the definition of equity is, and that is going to change. So USDOT defines equity as the consistent and systematic fair, just, and impartial treatment of all individuals, including individuals who belong to underserved communities that have been denied such treatment, such as Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Native American persons, Asian American, and Pacific Islanders and other persons of color, members of the of religious minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons, persons with disabilities, persons who live in rural areas, persons and persons who otherwise adversely affected are adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. It is important to know that transportation equity does not mean equal. An equitable transportation plan considers the circumstances impacting a community's mobility and connectivity needs. And it goes on. And the reason why that is important is that from my vantage point, the type of work that I do, I am focused on that specific community in which I'm working. And so from that standpoint, my analysis it's always gonna work to the needs of that specific community. But I do believe that there is a generalized framework that can be assessed. And that can be done through four points specifically. One, identifying the population in a general sense, where these are the steps, right, to achieve equity. Understanding the gaps in service. Um, three, uh, identifying disproportionate impacts and coming up with, with solutions. And four, making sure that we're engaging these specific groups that we just discussed as part of the general um, discussion for decision-making. And from that standpoint, I think that provides the structure or framework for conducting equity analysis. But then there are specific um, elements that are also required. So 
the Title VI circular even focuses on doing equity analysis for transportation service routes, right? And it's part of the route planning. And so from that specific context, you're looking at the service in the population that's being served along a specific bus route or transit route specifically. Uh, folks that live and work and in, engage with that line. And so from that standpoint, that is very localized. Um, but again, I think that general framework, as long as you're following those general steps, I think is helpful. And uh, we may want to ask our LA Metro colleague, who I know the question wasn't addressed to, if, if, if they have any additional thoughts. Jessica? Thank you, Tracy. Um, it's it's funny to see you looking for me. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I I think it's a it's a very complex issue. And one thing that for us as an office, we try to instill within our staff when we're thinking about decision making generally is that um a lot of the distrust and the inequities weren't built overnight, right? Um, and so a holistic framework, while ideal, and while we can and should strive for a holistic framework to, to ground our work today, isn't really going to address some of what, and I think, Johnny, what you were expressing too, that there's a lot of individual impacts, right? And we have to consider individual impacts while maintaining the whole in mind as well. And when you think about... I recently heard somebody talk about um, the need to just generally repair trust with American institutions. You know, we come to a community with a certain project or um, a certain question in mind, right? But they have a lot of concerns that aren't necessarily even going to be transportation first, or they're not going to see them first as mobility or transportation first. And so it does, it's going to take not just the holistic framework and the individually listening to community members, but also kind of stepping back and acknowledging that as, especially within the public sector, um, that we are the face of not just our agency, but of American institutions, right? And that a lot of that mistrust, a lot of inequities have to be addressed across the board before we're even at a place where the status quo isn't reflecting those inequities anymore. Um, one thing that we've tried to do in, in one project that's contentious uh, in LA is um, there was a freeway a widening project, the 710 freeway that you all may have heard of that recently got canceled. Um, it, it's a no build now because it was going to worsen air quality. And so we're going through a process of over the last two years of working with a task force that has CL community leadership committee, a CLC, all of those members are paid for their time. So they get to participate in the process. And it's a very small bucket, right? It's only 27 community members that we have on there, but they've been with us for two and a half years, very sustained level of engagement. And that little bit of engagement and that change in bringing them along the process we think is is what's going to pay dividends in the long term to building that trust in the community. But at the same time, we're realistic that it's not going to address everything. And just to zoom out again, that project was in planning for 20 plus years, and there was a lot of advocacy from community members against it. Um, and now we've done this task force with the community leadership committee for two years, like that's not going to address everything. So just kind of being patient um, and understanding that it's going to take a lot of time, just like it took a lot of time to get to where we are today. Great point. So this is for Johnny, and I'm going to combine a few of the questions um, because some of them repeat or some of them are similar. What do you think the future of cars, or how do you think the future of cars, maybe autonomous vehicles, technology, will impact views on public transit. And I'm gonna combine a couple of things. We have a couple of frustrated people that there isn't enough service to UCI. So you may wanna address that. And um, can you share an example of a time you engaged stakeholders early on and what were the outcomes? First thing, let's get it out of the way. Um, just are your comments, just give them to me and I'll delightfully take them back to the planning department. 
um, division, so they can, they can address those. And you know, service inadequacies are always an issue. Um, but I, I will say that we do also we conducted recently a uh, making better connection study, uh, which was to assess the post pandemic or yeah, I guess the post pandemic travel patterns what we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. And we started to roll that out, but it hasn't been completed yet. So I do believe we have some changes that would provide some more transit friendly access to and from the campus. So, um, but the, the, the planning process is always an ongoing thing. So please, whatever comments you have, I will gladly take them. Um, the second question, the first question was transportation and autonomous vehicles and technology. And I wanted to combine it with one more thing. It's a, a question from Zoom, and that is, um, has anyone addressed access to electric vehicles, charging stations, or EV buses? And if so, what metrics have we used? So it's a loaded question. I'm sorry. Um, First, the in terms of technology and transitioning from ICEs or internal combustible engines and going to EVs and even autonomous vehicles. Um, that's all, that's good for the environment. It is, but at the end of the day, we still have an issue with congestion, right? So I don't care how green your vehicle is, uh, you're still gonna have congestion. So how do you deal with the choke points? How do you deal with getting people out of their cars? Yeah, there's an environmental slant that you wanna get people out of their cars to clean the environment. But you also want to get them out of their cars, as some of the road loving people would say, yeah, I want you to get out of your car so it makes more room for me on the freeway. Right. So people are going to want to drive, but you still have to deal with the congestion issue. So um, that's something that even when we have the disruption of electric vehicles and that sort of thing, um, that that you still have to address the, the congestion issue. And you still want to make sure that your communities that you're building provide uh, a, you know, a series of options for people to move, not just really being uh, call oriented. Um, in terms of the transit, um, in, in terms of the transit piece, in terms of what we're doing to be green, we at OCTA are implementing what we what we call our zero emission bus pilot, um, and it's to comply with the innovative clean transit rule, by, which states that by 2040, all of the fleets, all, all the you know, vehicles in your fleet must be zero emission. And there are two technologies right now that apply to that. That is hydrogen fuel cell electric or plug-in battery electric. Right now, OCTA is piloting in both. We have uh, 10 hydrogen fuel cell electric buses. And we also have uh, 10 plug-in battery electric buses. And we are piloting and looking at and reviewing and evaluating those technologies to determine what which technology to go with or what mix of the technology to implement uh, to be in compliance with the innovative clean transit rule. Um, one of the things about OCTA, until recently, we had the largest hydrogen fueling station at our center and a base, and that was to fuel our, our hydrogen fuel cell electric buses. So um, we're looking to be green. Our OC streetcar is going to be electric. So we're looking to make sure that if you choose to travel on public transportation, that it is a green alternative, right? Uh, so my thought in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles, um, yeah, that's a scary thing in the public realm in terms of individual cars. Um, in terms of public transportation, um, I think it's nascent right now. I think that's being reviewed. Um, and there are going to be, before we even get to that point, there are going to be a lot of hurdles that we have to have to kind of cross over. One of those things from my perspective is, you know, I have a, as chief operating officer, I have a pretty good relationship with my coach operators. <laughs> so, you know, if you go to autonomy, then you've got to think about what happens to those jobs for one. Uh, two, you know, we are public transportation. And, you know, there is a customer service piece, right? One of the things that we're doing now with our coach operators is we're putting in the barriers uh, on our buses because we have a very angry and violent public right now who choose to kind of want to take some of their issues out on our coach operators and our passengers. And so to make sure that they're safe, we're putting in barriers. But there is a, um, I guess, a, a, a trade-off with that. And that is when you put them in a barrier at that point, um, it's kind of like, you're shutting them off from the customer service field, right? A coach operator is supposed to be there where you pay your fare and you talk, you ask them, how do I get here or there? But if you do it behind a window, it's kind of got that like, that that new millennium type of going to the bank. Remember back in the day, you go to the bank and you can talk to the teller and reach across and everything else, not in the bad way, but just kind of, now you go to the bank and the glass is up there and it kind of sends a message. The same thing with, uh, with our buses. And so we have to trade that off, right? So, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, 
uh, it's 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 really trying to to you know protect our coach operators, but they have that customer service feel, right? And you will lose that when you go to autonomy. So it's not that's a bad thing. It's just that we have to make sure that we address all of the, all the impacts uh, to that. Then there's the question regarding. Um, can you share an example of a time you engage stakeholders? Yes, I'll go back to my last year when I was in Georgia, because that's the last time I was really in the planning phase. And we engaged them early on, let them know what was coming. We advised them that, hey, look, you know, we, we I began, I actually had to get the presentation. I began with, you know what, right now in this recessionary environment, I shouldn't really be here talking to you about how we're going to cut your service. I don't even want to be here. I let off with that to let them know that, hey, I understand. But at the end of the day, this is where we sit right now. And we have to figure out what's going to be the best. And at that time, it was the first time that we rolled out. When we had our changes, we had the specific impacts. And we had actual GIS maps and showing them that we're going to cut your service here, but this is your option right, that you can take. This is your alternative. We do not want to fully disconnect you. We went out there with guiding principles and we said, hey, look, we want to maintain our ridership, right? We want to make sure that we have lifeline service out there for those who have a lot of non-discretionary trips. Make sure that you can make your dental, your, your appointments, dialysis, and all that sort of stuff. Want to make sure that we comply with all the environmental justice, Title VI, ADA mandates. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we have a system that is sustainable, that we can contract it or expand it based on our budgetary resources, but that it meets the community need. We were clear up front and our principles were, were prioritized, but we show we're trying to make sure that you don't lose your trip. But at the end of the day, there are going to be some casualties. The public appreciated that. They appreciated the approach to the alternatives. Once we got through the process, we got the, the board bought off on it too. That was key. Because, you know, on that board, we had Juanita Abernathy. Juanita Abernathy, I don't know if you guys know, but Juanita Abernathy was the husband of Ralph Abernathy. Ralph Abernathy was the best friend of Martin Luther King Jr. So on that board, we had that kind of sensitivity to making these changes to routes that have been operating in the same routes on the same streets since the 60s. And we're changing this service. So it was really, really, really sensitive. But we got that to go to our board. Our board approved it. The public was fine with it, and we maintained 90% uh, ninety percent of the average weekday ridership. Mind you, we chopped off about 30 routes, and we maintained 90% of the average weekday ridership that the board bought off on it, and the public, not all of them liked it, they accepted it. So that's my example of what it means. Now, OCTA, I did mention we're in the same mindset now where we are making sure that we're complete, we're thorough, we're transparent, we're letting you know what we can and cannot do, and we're very sensitive to making sure we meet your needs, because all the needs, if they, people don't like them, they'll let our board know, and our board will also kind of let us know there's what we have to do. But again, they remember our constraints and the fact that we have to meet a budget and we have a limited resources. And the last piece is, there's one on, one on, one on. Yeah, that's tough right now because right now we we have our hydrogen fueling station. Uh, we have 10 battery electric buses that we just received in December. And right now we're working with the Southern California Edison uh, company. And at the end of the day, do you know that we have chargers that we have now installed and we still can't charge our buses there? We're actually using chargers uh, that are for our um, our um, operator relief vehicles, which are vehicles that our coach choppers use, they're electric, but we have these little itty bitty chargers that we're using to charge this huge bus. And it takes like eight hours to charge, right? So there's no way we can get them all out on the street uh, and have them ready each and every day. So we've been limited with our battery electric buses. As soon as we have Southern California Edison make our chargers hot and ready, then we can charge our buses three hours at a time and uh, be ready to operate all 10 of them. So we're really early in the phase. So that tells you right then and there that charging and electrical charging, EV charging available for the public and access to them is something that has to be discussed later. Right now, we're just trying to meet our responsibility of meeting the ICT mandate and just getting our vehicles out there on the road consistently to test their reliability. One thing about our ZEP buses, I don't mean to go long. One thing about our ZEP buses is the fact that when we're talking about this ICT rule, we're already at low emission. We're about 95% in terms of emission free, right? It's the last 5% that's gonna be a heavy lift. Why? Because these zero emission buses, right? They carry the same number of people, 
right? But they cost twice as much and they don't have the range of our technology right now. Our CNG buses are the ones that are out there now. You're good for 350 miles on those buses, right? As they run every day on their routes. On a, on, a hydro, on a hydrogen fuel cell electric bus, you're good with 250 miles, right? And that's like the limit. You can't run it to zero because you got to get back to the, the base to charge it. So you're talking about maybe 200 miles. Hydrogen, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you can't get it back to fuel. You can't run out on the road. And then the battery electric buses are 150 miles. So again, there needs to be a thinking in terms of the number, what's going to happen to our fleet size. So these are all the things we got to think about when we're talking about transitioning to zero emission technology, just to get that 5% and go to zero emission. So that's all. Thank you. I'm sorry I combined so that's many, but that's why you handled it well. You handled it well. Tracy, how do you quantify the community's comments when you get them? These questions are fabulous. They are. Okay. So at PRR, remember I told you that we're an outreach and engagement firm, but, and, and so at PRR, our specific focus, um, our director of research, research uh, Dr. Gumby, I think would be happy that I'm talking about this. So um, from a standpoint, if we're doing a community survey and the questions come in and responses, we do the survey analysis, develop a summary report, and then our team goes back because everything can be done by a computer, and we identify key themes. Um, and then we report those themes to our clients. And when we develop the recommendations, um, so say uh, a team of engineers and planners are developing the recommendations, we're looking at uh, five alternatives. We measure the alternatives against a priority, a prioritization matrix that also identifies the comments that came in. So that's one method. The other thing, if we're doing comment cards, we come up with a comment, comment analysis tracker and then group uh, comment themes based upon that comments analysis tracker and look at how uh, the, the decision-making um, priorities are being decided and then report that information back to the community through a variety of formats. So one of the things that Johnny talked about is uh, this consensus exchange, right? Uh, consensus building uh, paradigm. And that is, you will not be able to accept every single comment that is made with an action to address that comment specifically. And so that's why that prioritization metric is so important. But communicating that you heard the comment, what you could address, and then what is either not going to be addressed and why, or that's not going to be addressed at this time is important. And that can be done through having additional community meetings, developing a newsletter, flyer, fact sheet. Uh, I love project wrap-up postcards. Um, you don't have to guess. You don't have to go to a website and find it. It came right to your home. This is what we heard. This is what we were able to do. These are the final recommendations. Um, it's important. And then finally, because I know we're getting short on time, I would say, um, I love, love, love story maps and other visualization um, techniques. Uh, we at PRR, we use uh, what is our COIN um, online open house, which is a interactive environment in which you can, you know, go to the point right here, 501, right? At 501, I need to be able to navigate four steps of stairs. How can I do that? So you're actually seeing the questions in context and being able to interact with those parties um, and provide feedback. And another tool that we've been utilizing a lot, and we used it for MTA for the Central Maryland Regional Transit Transportation Plan, um, we had uh, afternoon open houses where people could go on digitally and ask us questions about, and, and we would interact with them one-on-one, -on -one, kind of like what we're doing today, to talk about the priorities, decision-making, and answer questions that came up. I hope I answered that fully. It was great. Um, Jessica, what are the key aspects to consider when developing equity mapping tools? And I'm going to throw in another question. What kind of changes did you observe after introducing the tools? Was it expected? Great questions here as well, too. Um, so I think on the analytical side of things, 
and tying back to our equity focused communities map and some questions that came up in, in Zoom, um, when you're developing a tool to identify priority areas, it has to be, the indicators within it have to be good enough to capture what it is that you're trying to get at, um, but also have to be simple enough to be replicated uh, by somebody else other than yourself and to be communicated even more importantly um, to, to the stakeholders. And what that really comes down to then not thinking about it analytically in the logic and data that goes into a data mapping tool um, is thinking about who the user is. And so oftentimes a lot of tools, equity mapping tools get developed um, and they're very complex and they include a lot of great information and it's really kind of a multivariate analysis, right? That, that tells you a lot um, about different aspects. And so if you're familiar with Calenviro screen, for example, you might know that that has, I think about 20 indicators. Um, but if you're a community member trying to figure out what went into Calenviro screen, you have to go look at a technical report that's hundreds of pages long, and then you have to understand the, the sources, right? And so it's a really delicate balance between what is it that you're trying to measure and who is it for? Because the who is it for on the technical side, I completely trust like our planning staff to understand how to use a tool or how to understand what went into it. But then when we get into the project um, engagement phase with community members, they'll often have questions that um, our technical team doesn't know how to answer in terms that a community member will grasp, right? Or that we also risk, um, if we do have some community members who are more technically um, savvy, they might say, well, why didn't you include this, this, or that? And so you kind of just have to balance all these different things within it um, when you're thinking about it. And, and something that's worked for us recently with the equity focused communities map is the agency now has a user experience testing policy. So when you're rolling out something new, um, and for me, that's often just data and maps, you kind of have to go think about who are the users and do some testing with them to see if it's working or not. And we did that for our equity information hub, as well as the equity focused communities dashboard that I put in the Zoom Q&A. And in both of these tools, we found that because we have so many users in mind for an equity mapping tool, it's often not easy to communicate. And so we we get a lot of um, GIS analyst staff, you know, at partner agencies saying, well, your GIS equity GIS site doesn't look like an Esri website, so I don't know how to use it. But then we get community members who say, well, your search bar and what I can search for on your Esri website doesn't look like what I would expect if I were to open a browser on my phone or on my desktop. And so that's just one aspect of, you know, the, the users are very different and you have to just balance all those different things as well. And then lastly, when it comes down to using it um, in equity analysis, some of our staff um, in planning are more advanced in terms of their spatial um, analysis or quantitative analysis that they can do. But some of our staff are working from a policy perspective place where they just want to know, is this project that I'm working on located in an equity focused community or not? And so we have to develop a tool that's easy for them to use, but also um, can be robust enough for our more advanced technical staff to use. So I think that was a little bit over the place, but just suffice to say that you have to do a lot of user experience testing. Um, and there are gonna be a lot of surprises because you can't plan for, for everyone. So I guess going back to the consensus thing, um, you have to, even when, when you're developing your tools, think about what is the consensus point where it's gonna have the most use, um, not just analytically, but also for your engagement. Fantastic, thank you. Felisa. Are there any opportunities for K through 12 educators to engage with public transportation authorities to show young students how the system works, field trips, community storytelling, curriculum? Any thoughts to that? Um, 
Yes, definitely. But uh, <laughs> I don't know that I'm the best person uh, to ask at this stage. I'm very new to um, to California period, but to this area. Um, so are they looking for examples of um, outreach to, to K through 12 or uh, um, with transit agencies in the local area? And just developing curriculum. Oh, developing yeah. curriculum at the K through 12 level or sorry. I honestly, I don't know of any specific examples, but it sounds like a fantastic idea. I don't know if anyone else in the panel knows more. My interaction has always been through the Safe Routes to School program. I'm teaching children how to navigate not only their walk, but they're also their transit ride. Um, in many cities on the East Coast, uh, public transportation is utilized instead of school buses um, for kids as young as four years old to get to school. So that has been my orientation, but I'm sure Johnny has some additional examples. Well, well we just implemented the Youth Ride Free program. So Youth Ride Free. So, you know, those kids who are 18 years and under can, can ride the service for free, right? They have their car and they're going to school. And so this is educating the, the next generation and generations to come to be able to be used as a public transportation, right? So, so that's something that right now we're hoping, it's increasing our ridership right now, but it's also planting a seed about public transportation. Because me, that's important because when I lived in Orange County, I grew up in Orange County, I never rode a bus until I became a transit dependent student in Georgia, right? But I came back and now I appreciate it. But I'm coming to you from a career perspective. People, I'm up here right now as a 26 year transit professional. But when I came out of school, I wasn't not thinking about being a public transportation person. I wasn't thinking about working at a public transportation agency. And I think what we need to understand and we tell we educate children is the fact that a career in public transportation is not a bad idea. Uh, whether you're coming in entry level as a coach operator or you're coming in as a planner or a financial junior financial analyst, you know, there's a staircase. There's a staircase and there's a career. And I'm a testament to that. I went to school, went through all the engineering rigor, but I never held an engineering job. It was all planning, it was all in public transportation. I've worked in the public realm all that time. So I think there needs to be more thought process into the K through 12 to think about a career in public transportation, not just transportation in general. I went to school thinking I was gonna be a transportation engineer, but I ended up becoming a transportation planner, a transit planner specifically. So there are career opportunities and I'm putting that plug in because we need coach operators, we need a lot of people uh, that serve in the public transit realm because, you know, the boomers are really going to call it really, 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 they've been saying it for 10 or 15 years, but they're going to really, really call it a career. And we don't want to have this serious vacuum in the provision of our public transit service. I think that's one thing I wanted to say uh, while those were talking, um, which is just that when I did my master's in structural and material engineering, we did a lot of outreach with middle and high school students because it was really engaging to like break beams. Like that was something they, they could visualize and get excited about. I think it's a lot harder with transportation because we kind of just have simulations on the computer. It's a little bit less exciting to show a very large audience. Um, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to find ways to do that well, to try to recruit uh, high school students, especially in, into our college programs. Our time is coming to an end. I'm gonna ask all the panelists if they wanna say one last thing. After we cut the Zoom, I do wanna talk to my students for a few minutes. And then um, I do think that all the panelists will be happy to answer any questions that we didn't get to today, if you could stick around a little bit longer. Um, Johnny, I'm just gonna throw the mic to you and then Lisa, Tracy, to ask So what are we saying? We're just... well, that's our final time. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. And um, just again, a pleasure to be here and uh, thankful for the opportunity that I have at OCTA. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, transit is, I'm speaking to students now who are gonna be looking for opportunities and a career in transportation could be very fruitful and rewarding, uh, specifically in public transportation. As I was speaking to Tracy earlier, she very well knows outside of a sports or medical degree, every degree that you get can find applicability in a, at a transit agency or transportation agency. If you wanna be an attorney, if you wanna be a planner, if you wanna be an engineer, if you wanna be public policy, government relations, whatever it is, you know, information systems or IT, whatever it is. And so I'm putting that plug out there because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an advocate for the industry. As mentioned before, I do ride the service. 
Um, and, and that's the one of the ways with which I know I can start to change public opinion about public transportation is that I myself, I do have a choice. But through my urban planning, I chose to live in an area where I had plenty of public transportation and I still use it now. I leave my car at home. Uh, and I don't really need it to get to my get to my job. And when I'm on the bus, I see my coach operators and everyone else and they see me. It's very I'm very visible. And I'm just thankful for what this this career has afforded me and this line of work has afforded me. So I just want to implore you to think about opportunities in public transportation or just transportation in general. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again for having me on this panel, and I was so impressed with the questions that came in. I'm still new to this school, but I think that this group of students is very impressive and fantastic and intelligent and curious, and I'm also really glad that we have this colloquium on the topic of equity. It's so important. I'm glad that there's such a large turnout. People are interested. People care about these topics and want to learn more, and I have many notes that I took that I'm walking away with because I'm also still learning. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I think I started at the beginning by saying how excited I was to be here in a group of not only students, but also just the general transportation community that is joining us virtually. Um, and this is an important work and there are important topics. I would just challenge you to be bold. Be bold. Um, and the reason why I say that is I, I am, I work all over the country and I have for many years, um, for consulting firms that are 50,000 people down to PRR, which is only 104. And in every room that I go to with every client, I start by saying to them at an in, in introduction, I'm very direct. My job is to make sure I protect you from a Title VI challenge, but more importantly, that I open up your horizons for your team to recognize what they can achieve if they think outside the box. And that is really how I approach this work. And so it's important, um, whether you're a planner or an engineer, that when you are working in a team, that you speak up, that you give voice and power to those communities that are not at of all is of the most importance. If you work in a space where you are afraid to go against the grain, you are afraid to challenge authority. You are afraid to honor the principles that you learned at home with your families. You are doing yourself a disservice and you are not living up to the expectations and the work that your family, your community and your professors have invested in you. You have to be bold. And for those that don't understand that concept, I am really an introvert. When I'm home, I barely talk. Other than to give directions to my children and my husband would say into him too. Um, I spent a lot of time reflecting, but in this space, I'm so passionate about what I do. People really think I'm an extrovert, but I'm not. I just love this work. It's meaningful to me. And it has been my absolute pleasure if I don't do another day of service I know that I've left a meaningful legacy in this industry. There's nothing better than that. Still have one more panelist. Jessica, you want to be my own? <laughs> oh, yes, you are. Um, well, thank you everyone for these really great questions and to the panelists for the thought provoking presentations is a great way to spend an afternoon online as well. I'm sure in person, it's even it's even better. Um, if you should have any follow up questions, or if anything that I shared sparked any interest in researching the topics that we work on at LA Metro, feel free to reach out. Um, we're always open to partnerships and collaboration, because we know we're not going to do it alone. And we're looking for the best practices that everybody else is also developing. And I can give you Jessica's email if you want to reach out to her. And um, I know that Johnny has a stack of business cards that he brought with him. And um, all of you, you're, you're all making such an impact. And I've already told my students that what's wonderful about the field that they're in is the impact they can make. And you can make such a difference in people's lives as you've seen all four panelists do already. 
So thank you so much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you coming and, and Jessica for hanging in with us on Zoom. And um, for all of you for coming today, uh, Professor McNally. Yes. Yeah, it's rhetorical, I guess, but hopefully we'll have answers soon. So thank you, everybody. Are we off Zoom? Can you cut the Zoom?